She who dares wins. Alana Stott, MBE. Today I had the pleasure of interviewing Alana Stott, author, philanthropist, producer, entrepreneur, publisher, and member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Oh, and did I mention Mrs. Aberdeen and Mrs. Scotland winner? What stood out for me the most was her humility, pragmatism, and ability to provide and show action steps for success. During our conversation, Alana shared her, her experiences working with vulnerable women and raising awareness about mental health, particularly in the context of human trafficking. She stressed the importance of collaboration among charities and shared her insights as a charity contributor and how to ask for money. In fact, this is the title of her latest book, dropping today, 23rd of April. Check out the link below. I asked Alana crowdsource questions like, what's the biggest lesson learned from a failure? How do you prioritize tasks, actions each day? Awesome answer on this one, by the way. And to what do you contribute your success to being awarded your title? Alana also talked about her training as a protection officer or bodyguard and how it influenced her parenting role. We discussed the media attention towards Prince Harry and Meghan Markle and Alana's inspiration for writing books. It was a fascinating conversation and I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to it. Additionally, Alana's husband, Dean Stott, another former guest on the show, is a former British Special Forces soldier and a record-breaking adventurer. He is known for his charity work and his dedication to supporting military veterans. Dean has completed numerous endurance challenges, including cycling the length of the Americas in a record-breaking 99 days. Alana and Dean share a passion for philanthropy and have worked together on various charitable projects. They're also proud parents to their three kids and prioritize family time despite their busy schedules. Alana spoke about how Dean's experiences have influenced her own work and how they support each other's endeavors. Alana Stott, as I said before, is a philanthropist and true multi-hyphenate with a unique list of professional achievements that includes sales professional, bodyguard, Mrs. Scotland, CEO, writer and producer. She founded Wolf Raven Inc. as a vehicle to help tell amazing and inspirational stories, including her own, while fiercely advocating for causes aimed at making the world a better place. Alana has written her inspirational memoir, She Who Dares, her game-changing book, How to Ask for Money, and a series of six empowering children's books. She is producing multiple uh, television series and film projects, including a high-profile uh, collaboration streaming series that turns reality TV on its head. Alana was ordered the member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, MBE, for her services to vulnerable women and mental health awareness on the King's New Year's Honours List 2023. Overall, Alana and Dean are a dynamic duo who are making a positive impact on their respective fields. You can find Alana at alanastott.com and her books at the link below. Thanks for watching. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, and check out my new project for 2023 at hownottodie.com.au where I've combined all my special forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching. And we're live. Welcome to the Straight Talk Mind and Muscle podcast and welcome to my guest this morning, Elena Stott. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Going great here. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been um, a long time coming and it, it really is the way with a, a lot of different guests. So thank you for your patience and thank you for taking the time to come on. Um, prior to this, the listeners and the viewers have heard that video intro, but um, wow, uh, you, you have, uh, you need more of a whiteboard to describe what you do than I do. <laughs> uh, there's so, so many things, you know, author, philanthropist, producer, entrepreneur, publisher, and of course, now a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, 
I would like to maybe just launch off the um, what's it like to be a member of the uh, uh, a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. That is a mouthful. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just still trying to get used to everyone curtsying. And, and no, I'm not joking. I'm, I'm trying to make Dean do it, but he's not. He's not having it. Um, <laughs> it's it's you know we were really pleased to get. I think the um, award was for my services to vulnerable women and mental health awareness. So the mental health awareness would have come from the work we done. Um, on Dean's bike ride and the funds that we raised for that so that was you know it was a good little acknowledgement I still firmly believe Dean should have one as well but that's a different story but um, it was a good acknowledgement for the work we've done there but the the vulnerable women side of it is obviously my bigger passion so to be kind of acknowledged for that it does and and you know with with any title whatever it might be it, it does help open doors so that's the biggest benefit to me let's punch down that road thank you for opening up give me some direction um vulnerable women and mental health awareness is that mental health awareness in women and and combined um so human trafficking has always been my biggest passion that's what i've worked in for you know 20 years or something now um so when Dean, my husband, for anybody who doesn't know, he cycled from Argentina to Alaska and broke two world records. When he decided he was going to do that, we were always going to do it for human trafficking because of the route in particular. That was one of the main reasons. But then when Prince Harry spoke to him about this mental health campaign he was doing, my 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 stuff went out the window and it was like, let's do it for mental health, um, which wasn't too bad because I think I learned during the process of working with Heads Together, which was Harry's... Um, mental health campaign it brought together 11 different charities all all in the field of mental health and I guess it, at the time when we were doing it I didn't didn't know much about dealing with mental health um you know before then I guess me and Dean probably probably did have some sort of issues but we were definitely the type of people that were super stoic about it and were just ignoring and so yeah spend time with every charity so there was the children's charities the veterans charities the uh, women's charities all of these different ones and you would you would learn there was a lot in common there was you know certain I identifiers that you could pick up on to see that each branch had their commonality but uh, working with the children in particular that was where I really got to learn about kids in sort of inner city London maybe um people that, that were here on asylum, things like that. There was a lot of trafficking involved in what they were doing. So I learned a lot about things like sexual abuse and mental health and various different things. So it actually did give me a lot of benefit to go forward in my my other stuff with the human trafficking. So yeah. um, it was quite interesting because I almost was coming as an outsider looking in like mental health. You know, you, when you speak to people like Kelsey and things, you'll, you'll hear super passion about fighting mental health and it wasn't my thing, so I really was looking at it objectively, and I was saying, right, what do you need? You know, how much money do you need? What's that going to do? Let me get you that. And it was, it was, it was from that perspective. But what it also helped us do was we were coming into these meetings with eleven charities, and for example, veterans uh, suicide prevention in the UK, there was like over two thousand charities working in that field. Right. And we were like, if you could just like work together, <laughs> there would be a hell of a lot more more outcome and also when we were dealing with donors so my job was to go out and find the donors when they would find out there was a collaborative effort going on between them they were so much more willing to get involved so yeah after finishing the mental health campaign I took that same mindset into the human trafficking world and said look start working together because really what happens is when you know something becomes popular so 2016 mental health became a popular cause to to fight against when human trafficking comes into play what happens is there's all these loans and grants and government um incentives so all these little pop-up charities come up and and they're all kind of fighting against each other for the same um pot of money that's available. yes um, yes so so i i was finding that you know, I was at one point I had two charities in the room who done it, and I mean exactly the same thing to a T in uh, trying to end orphanages, um, there because they're obviously a hub for for trafficking. And I was like, right, you guys are at this stage doing this thing, you guys are at this stage doing this thing. If you actually pulled your resources together, you would achieve what you want to achieve so much faster. But they'd never spoke to each other, and they felt like there was so much 
ego involved in it. They wanted to be the ones who done it. They wanted to be the first. And I said, well, is it you that wants, or do you want the kids safe? Like, which yeah. ones? Gosh, I'm quite stunned that you, you've said that, that you identified it, that you saw it in up to 200 charities for mental health. And, but then even worse, uh, Elena, two in the room. And I, I say that because I interviewed Heston Russell over here. So two commando major um, and uh, went on after leaving the, the unit uh, to uh, work with mental health and veterans. And he said exactly the same thing. There's much less over here, you know, not 200 entities, but he said they are competing against each other, which is even worse than what you're saying. Um, and I, I got a bit of a handle on it, but you sort of brought more into it because you'd wonder why if you're totally, you're totally unbiased at looking at the mental health side, just going, well, hang on a sec, you're going for the same sort of thing. If you collaborate and clearly as a, as a donor, you'd want to just work on uh, with people who are together as a team. Why not as a team? So you're thinking it's mainly ego and um, and, and they want to to win or, or get the, the pot of money, yeah. as it were? There's definitely, um, if something's going to happen, somebody wants their name to be associated with it. I mean, you see it with politicians, you see it without, you know, something has to happen in their four years or in their tenure, their period. Yeah. So it comes this kind of battle to achieve it. And, and I was all, almost finding that, like, not to be sexist here but the, the ones that were male ran were, were definitely there was this fight in, in the uk maybe to get these awards like an yeah. mbe um to to have that first to, to to be that name on that charity because you know then there's higher salaries that can be demanded there was all sorts of different reasons wow. um, and the larger a charity was getting it becomes more of a business than it does uh, a charity so right. um you know the smaller kind of mom and pop kind of charities were always the ones I loved working with because they still had that passion for the yeah. cause other ones could almost become like they're just trying to sell you merchandise or something every time you speak to them so oh. but what the, the benefit that I had was I'd already gone out and fundraised so I would say have like 200,000 pounds ready to be donated and I would say but I'm only this is only going your way if you work together if you do something together right I suddenly want to work together so <laughs> started happening and it was amazing every time we got them into the room together and we sat down and said what initiative can we do together here something would come up and something would happen and then I think then you would start to see well actually guys do you do you not see that there's a legacy that you could leave behind whose name doesn't matter but the legacy is is what's important yeah and we did you know I mean the children's mental health helplines that we opened up the, we had a suicide prevention minister appointed to the government there was all sorts of things came from and even now I speak to people that were involved and they said, Alana, the waterfall effect is still going on from the work that was done during that campaign. And that's that's the most important thing to me is that it's still happening. Wow. Suicide Prevention Minister added that's phenomenal. And um, I love how you've taken the problem, and this is probably going to be a, 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 a story through the whole whole show. You take you identified a problem, you've taken it, and then you've actually modeled it to, to what you need as the outcome which was hey here's 200k let's let's um put this to to really good use rather than um just saying oh you guys aren't, aren't really working together so well um i do have a question very basic one what is human trafficking because when i think about it, i think of taken the, the movie taken and liam neeson going and getting his, his daughter what and, and i know i do understand it's a bit different so what is human trafficking um, so it's interesting, actually, I got asked to do a TED talk last year, and my TED talk was based on on trafficking and slavery, which is one of the same thing. It's, you know, the abuse of... of I'll, just, I'll just add that to the list of things, TED talk speaker. <laughs> yeah. um, I actually turned it down in the end. I was, I was working on this TED talk for, you know, it was all set up and it was ready to go, and it was very much about... Today in the world that we live in, we've got more slaves than ever before. And around the, the kind of BLM movement and everything else that was going on there, there was this huge fight for this injustice. And it was it was kind of driving me a bit crazy because I was saying there's there's slavery today. Yeah, you're going pulling these statues down and you're doing all these like, you know, signifying things, but there's 46 million people trapped in slavery right now. But let's put our focus on on that rather wow. than on on the past and what's happened in the past we're not changing yeah. it. it's actually you know we've never had 
as many slaves as what there is in the world today, you know. So um, part of what I talk about in the TED talk that I'd created was the statistics, you know, we, we look at the, the statistics and then we look at human trafficking and slavery and we talk about sexual slavery and these things made the um the host of that TED talk really uncomfortable. She says oh, she wow. didn't really feel that we should be saying the word slavery when talking about human trafficking. And I would say, look, it's one of the same thing. It's, it's mm. the same. Um, and that she didn't feel that sexual abuse was something that should be mixed into this conversation. And I would obviously try and explain to her that sexual abuse is a big part of, of trafficking. So eventually I just said, look, what she was trying to get me to create was something that anybody could, could do. Anybody could read out on a stage. So I said, I can't do it if it's not going to reflect what I want, because I don't want to stand here and tick the box to say, I've got a TED talk. I want to stand here and make a change. I want people to go out and say, actually, well, you know, if I would just do this one little thing, change the thing, you know, if I'm in a salon and someone's doing my nails and it's costing $10, like, can I do the maths? Is she being paid properly? Is this working out? You know, just the little things that, that I wanted people to take away from this talk. I said, yeah. so I, I can't, I would have to respectfully decline to do, to do that one. So, uh. um, but yes, I mean, I still definitely want to, to, to do it as long as I can speak about. It. And I think what didn't help was she worked for Amazon as well. Yeah. And Amazon is a, a huge contributor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely the right decision. I've definitely looked back on it and says, you yeah. know, I'm glad I kept it. But, um, you know, trafficking is the buying and selling of, of, of humans, you know, and, and for, so slavery, human trafficking, I just see it under the same, same band. In. And we work in, we look at different subjects I and mean, sexual slavery is probably the, the biggest thing that I would fight against and um, which would involve, you know, grooming um, and you know, you're taking kind of yeah. work. Um, and then you've got domestic servitude, you've got forced labor and I, and it goes to organ harvesting, which is one that's not spoke about as much, but it's definitely something that's very real and, and happens. So wow. there's a way of people being bought and sold throughout the world. And it's so hard to believe um, because it's just not in our consciousness. I mean, we referenced the movie Taken, which is a, a simple way of doing it, but I believe there was another one with actual, um, I'm wondering if it was Ryan Reynolds woke up and he'd lost a lost a kidney or something. He'd been kidnapped a few years ago, but it's just not in our consciousness. I, I, I was reading the other day, last year, and I can't remember the numbers, the drug traffickers, the cartels in, in Mexico and so on, um, they almost made them more money trafficking in humans um, and trafficking, having a different word, maybe meaning querying them over and so on, and humans than, than drugs. And this year, their business model is on point to, to outrate the, the profits from drugs. So that's a lot to combat against. Yeah, and I think with the thing with drugs as well is if you are found in your car with a block of heroin, for example, I mean, that block of heroin can maybe make you 500,000, you know, you could profit off of it, but if the police find you with it, you're probably going to go to jail for like 20 plus years, it's done. Yeah. You're found with a girl in your car. You've the police have got the job of first proving that it was non-consensual, then that it was slavery, then that you're dealing on on mass slavery, and it's just not just one one on one. Um, it's it's almost an impossible task to prove, and then you've got the girl to actually speak in the first place. So, yeah. trafficking people against drug trafficking is far less risky for for the drug dealers, and it's easier, and there's a lot more commodity available. So, yeah. Um, drug dealers have moved into switching space. Well, Look, uh, I'm, I've got a how not to die guy um series coming out just of survivors and i've got a, a woman whose daughter 17 year old daughter uh snuck out of the house at 1 a.m one morning to go meet her friend who's also 17 years old and and get in a car with a man so the man was 30 plus um long story short the the friend had been groomed by this man for a couple months and the daughter got in this car she wasn't feeling quite right the the best friend's going that's okay the car got pulled it's in new york the car got pulled by one cop mm -hmm. and he just didn't think something was right and long story short within about 10 minutes 20 minutes we were taught in police if you don't know what's going on just start calling people call people and um and they were surrounded by cars and they realized this guy was not supposed to have these 17 year olds in the car they rang the mum and she's like no she's in bed 
A, if that one guy hadn't had done something, they wouldn't be safe. They're safe now. But B, exactly what you said, that guy got let away. He was not arrested. It's all done. So the, the law, the legal system is, is not really set up exactly what you said. And I'm giving a, I'm quoting a real world example from someone that's coming on the show. Yeah, and the, co the cops are trained in some places, but like, so in the States, you know, we've got 50 different, we've moved here two, three years ago, and it's kind of mind blowing that there's there's 50 different states with 50 different sets of sheriff's police, you know, and then you've got the FBI, and then you've got all, so to try and teach, I mean, I know I work with the Orange County Human Trafficking Task Force here, and they're brilliant, they do go around each department teaching them, working with them, yeah. helping deal with survivors, helping them identify, um, it's really super work that they do, but yeah, you're right, it's, 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 not, it's not a curriculum that's really teached throughout the, the police forces, so to be able to spot a victim against, you know, especially when you're in places where prostitution is illegal, you know, they're not going to want to say they're doing what they're doing. And a lot of the times as well, I hear a lot of the people, they almost want that taken kind of victim, you know, the girl crying and wanting to be saved and please help me. And these girls are super desensitized and they're super angry and they're, 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 they're hard, you know, and they're not going to be crying and being the victim. They're going to be fighting and they're going to be, you know, yeah. So but with the, the example of your, your friend, it's just super common. And then the, the, the friend of the friend is the one who gets involved in it. But um, the, my my only advice there is, from, you know, my daughter's 11 years old and we talk all the time. Like I'm not really backward about what I speak about with her. Yes, I'll sensitize it a little bit, but really we do talk about it in full detail. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, I can't remember the name of it, but there was a really good movie the other day I was watching, and it was about a girl who'd been taken, but she'd obviously been taught. So she was talking herself through what was going to happen and where was the escape points and where was the what to do and how to keep the guy. And uh, me, me and Molly really talked about it throughout the whole thing, and, and we were speaking about what she would do because I identified really early on that she's a freeze. My son, he's a fight. He's a, you know, if he's in a situation, he'll fight. My daughter's a complete freeze. If you know, if she's crossing the road and a car comes at her, she'll stop. So you can work on that, but you can't change that natural instinct. So I said, right, if, you, if you're going to be like that, these are the steps you have to take if you're in this situation. So. You know, at 11 years old, she's online. Her friends are online. She's constantly texting her friends back and forth. And I think we've had, at this stage in her life, she's already had three instances where people have tried to approach her online. Wow. Um, all she does with me is come straight to me. As soon as the, the approach is made, she comes straight to me. I deal with it from then. There's no there's no anger. There's no shouting. There's no, like, no removing of the phone. I think that's the thing that drives me the most crazy. You know, back in the day, it was the predator in the park you know the guy with the big long coat on who was like flashing the kids or whatever yeah yeah very different <laughs> yeah now the predator the, the park is is the internet that's what the park is now so it's like you saying to your kids right you're not allowed to go to the park because there was a dodgy guy there one day right um, you're punishing the kids because of what this this dude's up to so yeah educating them and teaching them and saying look there was a guy who done this and then then we'll deal with it as the adults we'll do that bit but the internet is their their place they were born into it you know me and you know a life without internet they don't yeah, yeah. it was literally 2000 and and uh I know, 1999 i think i was around the time i got the hotmail account <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me and Dean were discussing that yesterday. I think I was when I travelled Australia. That was when I got my first account. So yeah, it was a while ago. But it was about two thousand. Yeah. Wow, it's a different world. That's a great analogy. Thank you for for saying that with the children, the phones, and you know, so often in these shows, one thing somebody says jumps out, and 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 I'll get messages back. Um, you know, this saved my life, or this did this, and, and so on. But that's phenomenal and really clever uh, analogy with the park and the internet. Let's move on a little bit. You said some interesting things because I got a lot to unpack. But you were the way you're talking there with um, educating your daughter, and you didn't go into it too in depth. You know, you've you uh, trained as a, a protection officer, bodyguard, whatever you want to call it. What inspired you to do that compared to you know writing children's books and 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 uh, being awarded by the king? What where did you? Why did you go down that uh, that route for upskilling? It was 2010 when my uh, husband, he was um, injured out of the military, so he had a bad parachute accident and 
um, was medically discharged. So he had to find a new route of what he wanted to do. And at the same time, I was I was transitioning out with the bank. I was working as a bank manager at the time. Oh, wow. um, I've always been really good with with finances, but it you know it doesn't excite you. It's not, it's not that. <laughs> um, so a friend of mine, she worked for a, an organization called Stop the Traffic, and she the hit when the Haiti disaster hit. So whenever there's a disaster, an earthquake, anything, um, in the, where the kids are are orphaned or separated from their parents, that's a big move for the traffickers when they come in. So, um, the traffickers had moved into Haiti. There was makeshift orphanages set up for five and under, and she said to me, Alana, the kids are being trafficked. I've just had an eighteen month old taken. They're 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 being taken. So. Um, she said, I need to get in there to, to get this orphanage safe. But she had a price tag in her head because people knew who she was. She knew she was coming in to help the children. So right. and it was something like five dollars. It was ridiculous that people were being offered this money to, to take her out. So she said, can you get me some guys? Is there anybody you know? So I called around a lot of people that I knew and there was people willing to do it. But the price tag was huge Like for a close protection officer who was willing to go into a hostile environment. And I said to Dean, why can't I get these guys to do it for free? This is saving kids, you know. And, and he said, well, you know, it's their business. It's, it's, it's something they've got to charge for. So I said, right, I want to be in a position that we could do this. And right. I never charge for it. So that was how we both ended up going on and doing the course. Uh, Dean obviously already had all his training with the special forces and things, but this was a civilian course, which he would need to do anyway. Yeah. Um, so he, you know, he obviously sailed through it. I was learning all the time. It was, it was a, it was a four week residential pretty intense course um, with a guy, James Johnson, who was um, ex SAS, fantastic, amazing guy. Um, and he, because I was the only female, he was really helpful to me. He would give me little extra lessons like that, that wouldn't necessarily be to the men. So it was it was really it was really good time. So I learned a lot about the protection field during that, the people that I met, and then and then I actually fell pregnant with my daughter. So the oh. demand for pregnant bodyguards wasn't very high at the time. <laughs> so um I ended up doing most of the the business side of it. So Dean would be out there doing the work and I would be back doing the, the kind of business Business this is side. interesting um because you've gone from you know putting your body in the way of of danger between you and the principal you, or for the for the normal people that, that talk you and the person you're protecting um but now you got bubba um you know some of the stuff i do with how not to die guys actually be um there's be your own bodyguard but you actually brought it bodyguarding your your baby you're bodyguarding your toddler bodyguarding your your kids you're bodyguarding your your wife if it's that way or the wife of the man in this case um how has that translated in any way to your parenting? And when I say that, so to contextualize for those people that aren't parents, when you got one bubber in your, your hand, you got the car seat, and you got your handbag, and you got everything else, situation awareness can drop through the floor. So, how did they go with parenting with your, your daughter, Elena? I think for me, it only really got stronger because I've got three now. So, I've got an 11, a six, and a five month old. And all three of them have got obviously very different needs at these stages so you're having to be careful of of all three um all three aspects of that life but the kids have always worked with us in whatever we do like our life really didn't change we carried on you know we were at security shows yacht shows i mean harley was at the shot show which is the biggest gun show in uh, vegas when she was three months old you know so we've always carried on doing all these things but we make it super fun for the kids. So for example, if we go to a hotel on holiday, my uh, daughter, she does this thing where she'll close her eyes and count the doors to the fire exit. So whatever room we're in, she'll count how many doors it is, but she has to do it blind. Um, when we go to bed at night, she's the one who checks the doors locked, put the uh, door stop underneath the door. She does all these things, but definitely not out of fear. It's out no. of fun. They, they do it as a fun thing and it's it's an adventurous thing for them so we've always done those things and then as a as a female I give her that extra little step you know I think we in America you hear a lot about the the the, the little boys that get the talk you know especially uh, boys of color who need to talk about what to do when the police pull you over etc et oh we'll yeah talk. okay yeah I always say that little girls get the talk as well um we all all 
all little girls get that talk about you know how to behave how to dress how to act how to all these things and and i i do do that with her you know she she still has that but she has all the extra things like you know if you feel uncomfortable when someone's walking behind you move to the side make noise uh you know puff yourself up whatever it might be and i've seen a few videos recently of some some cool women doing some cool stuff but um it's what i was saying to dean the other day like as women we're often like taught to be polite you know mm. don't, don't kind of rock the boat and i'm kind of the opposite of that i'm all very you know i'm pleased and thank you and everything else but if you feel if your gut's telling you something's not right then listen to it and and act because i think as women we have to take that little extra step i love that you said that um i had sean grogan on the show hasn't published yet american police officer uh, expert in body language and expert in um uh pre-fight indicators and um, one of the things um, that females so often do is they sorry, so all females have a much better um, uh, sixth sense, as it were, that something's not right. And uh, and then even that basically comes from reading body language, is it 10 times better than man is in comparison? Um, but so often you're, you're desensitized, oh, it's like, you know, let them touch you, you know, be polite, all these things, and you don't you, you dumb those senses down and it's a woman's superpower the female superpower is that sixth sense that something's not right and it's great that you're you're, you're showing that to your daughter you when somebody is attacked and you speak to them afterwards and they say yes they knew i knew something wasn't right i knew it wasn't feeling good and you're like you have to listen to that what it's yeah. telling you like that is giving you that indication but yeah we're, we've just been trained over the years be the good girl don't don't you know don't rock the boat don't be bad like don't offend people that's another thing and I think that more I was speaking to a guy the other day and he was like I wouldn't be offended if a, if a woman was afraid and moved to the side or or across the road or you know no I wouldn't be offended if she feels safer doing that absolutely the only people that would really take offense might have bad intentions yes absolutely bad guys for sure um I love, oh, apparently it's quite love when I say it. Um, a weapon is a tool for help, helping a bad guy change his mind. Yeah. Um, that's really, really cool um, that you, you did the bodyguarding course. And uh, maybe I'll put the link in the show notes if it's publicly available, but I've got the, the notes there. And you were talking about Dean with his accident in 2010 and moving on. Um, in his book, uh, and we're going to yours down the track, but in his book, he sort of said, you were the glue that held everything together. In particular, the glue that held to everything together for the world record attempt. That was pretty stunning. So how did you find it? We've got it, you know, listen to the audio book, I've got it from his point of view. But what was it like from your point of view, trying to let the guy do his thing on the pedals and you're in the background trying to keep everything on track and steady? What was that like? Um, I've often spoke to my friends about this because... A lot of my friends have got the more nine to five life and they, they say, I don't know how you can do it. And I think, well, I never met Dean in some, he wasn't working in an office when I met him. He was, he was in the special forces. And for me to say to him, you're going to go and do nine to five and be normal and be home every night. And I'm going to see you. It would be a disservice to him. That's not who he is. Uh, so, but when he was going to Libya and he was doing all these things, it was getting scary. Cause I was like, one day your luck's going to run out and you're not going to come home. And I don't want that. So the bike ride was like, well, you can still get this adrenaline rush, but you're slightly safer than, than you are in like Libya or Yemen or Somalia. Um, so it had to be something crazy. It had to be something like 14,000 miles. And that's what we, we, we started off with there. Um, and really the, the only way that I could, I could support him, like his physical ability is something that I've never, never known in anybody else. It's, it's insane. Um, but I had to keep his mental strength going. Like I often see people when they say to me, can you help me with this challenge? And just maybe five, 10 minutes of listening to people tell me about their challenge. I can generally know if they're going to do it or not. And right. it's not just about them. It's about the support network they've got around them. I'll listen to maybe the wives or the friends or the people and I can generally feel if there's any negativity or if there's any like, yeah, but if he doesn't do it, you know, those types of things. Like we never spoke about Dean not doing it. It just wasn't a conversation we had. So to keep his mental strength, I had to keep everything like 
the bills, the anything that was going on with the business, anything that was going on with the kids, that had to stay well away from him. Yeah. And he just concentrate on training every day. And even when he was on the ride, it was it was very, very rarely I would come to him. And it used to, like if there was an issue on the ride and the support team would go to Dean, it used to drive me nuts because I would be like, guys, just stop putting the mental stress on him. He needs to be totally clear in the head uh, to do this. So everything was like kept well well away from and that's not for everybody some people do need that extra support and I completely 1000% understand it I mean there was days I would be curled up in a ball crying in a corner but you know you it's 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 an ebb and flow really in a relationship I'm I'm just waiting for Dean to to pay me back but it'll come (laughs) (laughs) and there was a moment in the journey when uh the support team to, there was a mutiny of sorts. I, I think I could put it that way. And and I think one person or, or so on just wasn't on board, wasn't in the right direction. There's a bunch of different reasons. And Dean was great and in, in not really blaming blaming that. But um, you guys had to sort of grip that up. Was that you that was that just had to go, right, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to grip this up? Yeah, I think a lot of people would say it was a huge benefit to have Prince Harry involved. It, you know, bless his heart, but it was it was a nightmare because it attracted so many <laughs> wrong people. You know, people just wanted to get involved for all these wrong reasons. And um, when the ride was going on, I think I'd spotted problems earlier, and there was one that we 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 parted ways with quite early on. Um, and then the other guys that were on the road, they were you know I think within about maybe 10 days that you were seeing the social media you were seeing things going on and I think what they were getting upset was that Dean was getting a lot of the attention and I was trying to say to them that he was the one riding the bike what we were doing was the easier job and I I got that it was really boring and that they were you know it was one of them didn't like the accommodation they had to stay in (laughs) so I was trying to appease them all and trying to keep them all going but I think my problem is is that I'm maybe not that diplomatic when it comes to things like that. I would maybe a bit like suck it up a little bit. But um, I would say that if I was to ever do it again, there would be contracts and it would be done in a different way. I wouldn't just think that everyone was doing it out of the kindness of their heart. Um, I'd be trying to keep them from bothering Dean every day. Um, and I think it was consuming them. What they were the 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 issues that were going on were were really getting on top of them. And so, for example, when Dean had an accident, I think day 14. Then he went over a bar and the oh, heart yeah. monitor he had gone like bang. So the report I got back from the medic was that he had a heart murmur and that there was um something that needed to be checked every 24 hours. We needed to keep an eye on it. And it was like 10 days and I didn't have a, any report back and he hadn't been checked. I asked Dean, I said, are you being checked? He said, no, because they're too annoyed with the accommodation or whatever else is happening. I was like, okay, this is becoming a problem. So I was constantly trying to like appease them, not get it back to Dean. And then um, later found out that the guy who was the one who'd been sent away earlier was actually contacting them and rocking the boat the whole time. And there was all sorts of things going on there. So the the, the issues were happening nonstop. So eventually by Mexico, I, it was Dean's birthday. And I just said, look, can you do this without them? And he, and he said, yeah, no, I can. There was one guy that said, well, there was a good guy and he was like, I'm going to stay and I'm going to take them through to the end. Yeah. Do it without them. So they did. And they went one, you know, one of the guys was a mechanic. So um we'd lost the mechanic. So they ended up just YouTubing it and, and learning how to do all this stuff. <laughs> and then I would find like people along the way. People were super helpful. Bike shops would come and meet Dean and fix things for him. People would give him um massages and then, that was something I had to be really careful with when I was traveling through certain areas, booking yeah. massages. Um, so yeah and then at the very end of it all um when Dean was kind of approaching Prudhoe Bay about to hit the 99 day mark we I I received um a legal letter that said that we weren't allowed to use any of their logos and things knowing that he was just about to cross the finish line and that his whole everything was covered in their logos um I was like, how do how do we not film the finish line being crossed? It was crazy. Yeah. So then, um, then they kind of went on a bit of a, a legal campaign afterwards. And then there was anonymous letters and a lot of abuse. I was receiving like text messages saying Dean was having affairs. There was everything that went oh. on. 
But then I think they, you know, it was things like when they went after my daughter's school, she was about, she was eight at the time and they were like sending tweets and things to my daughter's school, like calling Dina cheat, all sorts of different things there. Um, and we tried to get legal advice, but we'd never experienced anything like this. And the abuse online that we were getting was just like crumbling for us. So there wasn't oh. really a moment that Dean got to celebrate his his achievements. It was it was kind of taken, you know, the press attacked, and it was all because of the, the Prince Harry connection, really. So um, but you know, we learned so much from it. We we really did, and we didn't, we're not neither of us are victims, you know. We went through and we we learned and we grew stronger. And yes, there was points that we were like, let's just give up. Let's just just go and hide under a rock somewhere. But that lasts for a minute. And then we're like, no, come on. We've got stuff to give the world. Let's keep going. Gosh, there's a bit to unpack, Elena. <laughs> um, I was support team for a, a, a soldier when I was in the army, um, walking in New Zealand the length of... Um, basically from one hospital at the top of uh, the country down to the bottom of the other other island in the country. And all of it was for the mission because and it, it wasn't special forces at that stage, but especially when you're in the special forces, it's <clears throat> mission, unit, country, family, in that order. Unfortunately, it has to happen for the, the thing. And all of us in the military understood it. Oh, hang on a sec, this is all about, his name is Nathan, um, rest in peace. Um, and, and it was all about him. You didn't once think about any hardship of yourself. So the civilians looking at it, uncontracted, the egos involved. I mean, when you're saying the social media, of course, it's going to be all about the guy on the pedals because that's all that matters. That's He's the guy, the one person that can do the world record. It's quite um, disappointing that so many humans are the weak link there. But then also afterwards, and I, you know, when I was doing my research for, for Dean's show, I did do some research and I, I relatively did quickly discounted those, um, the naysayers, as it were, that I was reading about. You mentioned quite briefly the Prince Harry connection, and particularly with what's come out with the book that Jess is reading, the reality of the, the firm and so on. Are you, are you sort of saying that because you guys were connected there, you were tarred with that same brush and, and had some um, some abrasiveness put on you? Yeah, sorry. Should I move? Can you hear the noise next to me? No, no, there's no, there's no extra noise. We're good. Oh, oh, like, oh it's cool. Got family sorry. life going on. That's that's think, very uh, normal. Like a kid's party is just entered or something. But my boy's out there having breakfast and he wants to come in and say hi to you after we finish recording. So it's all oh, good. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you were speaking about... Prince Harry, was that what yeah, I'm. I'm just wondering about the the connection there. What I mean, where did all this hate and um and 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 uh, just rubbish and lies come from? and directed at you guys because it just didn't. It, it was incongruous compared to what I'd seen. I think from from the the way that I was looking at it outside looking in because you know you couldn't really dismiss Dean. He was he was a you know 16 year veteran like served. I believe four tours, um, injured out. You know, he he done everything he could for his country. So he he's and then he was doing this amazing thing for a mental health cause. Um, partnered up with Harry and everything was really cool. And obviously Harry's got together with Megan. Um, and I I do think the country did love her when she first came in in. But I think straight away when the the press went into over mode with him, I think, um, he. He decided he just didn't want to to do that, and he didn't want to play the game anymore. So there's something called the Royal Rota, which is a group of um, press that are allowed access to to the royals, and they get. So Harry had said he didn't want to be part of that Rota anymore, and I think what happened there was that that was when the press almost turned on them, and they said, "Look, well, you know, if you're not going to um, abide by our rules, then we're we're going to go for you." you know if you're, I mean? you're not with us, you're against us, sort of thing. So. Um, with that, it was, it, it, you know, then I think there's the, the profit from clicks as well. So anything that had Megan or Harry featured on it got a lot of clicks, still does. So they were always looking for a new story, something that they could put. So when the support team uh, decided to go to a journalist, and this journalist had actually approached Dean before and asked Dean for stories on Harry and Dean had said no. So one of the support team approached this journalist and said, look, you know, we want to try and do some stories on Dean. And they said, what is it? And for some reason, they made up the story that Dean had cheated on the bike ride, saying that he'd used two bikes. That was the story they'd, yeah. they'd set 
So on the Guinness World Record, um, you you were allowed to change up frames if it was broken or if parts were broken or anything, but you had to use obviously the same type of bike. It had to be the same type of bike. I, I believe Mark Beaumont done one in Africa and Mark would correct me, but I think he used like 14 different bikes like because you're breaking them all the time and things are going wrong. Yeah. Luckily, Dean's one was pretty good and he didn't, we did have a second frame, never had to use it. But if we did have to use it, it would have still been within the guidelines. So yeah. it made no real difference. So I was actually just, it was, it was, um, I believe it was Remembrance Day. And I organized every year, I would organize event for Special Forces soldiers in um, Edinburgh. And, and I'd organized this event at this amazing hotel where they'd all just come together, have dinner and have a chat. And I got it was it was in the rugby uh, season as well. So the rugby guys had come down to join them. It was a really cool event. And that was just about to start. And I got this call from this journalist saying they were waiting on this story in the, the mail on Sunday that Dean had, had cheated on this bike ride. And I said, well, what is your story? They told me and I said, look, I'll send you the Guinness guidelines. I'll send you the Strava report, the report from Guinness saying that Dean, you know, completed it. Like I sent them everything. And I mean, like they had every piece of data, every log, but they ran the story anyway. It yeah. was, it, it blew my mind that you were even allowed to do that. Like when, when you'd been proven that it was incorrect, what they were yeah. saying, still ran with the story. And it really like hit Dean really hard because his integrity is is everything to him so to be accused of of doing that when he just what he'd done was unbelievable and um and I was really trying to keep him strong but it really did crumble him for for a lot of it so um oh. we went back to Guinness and we said this has been written about us is there anything you could do so they done another investigation and then came back again saying no not absolutely nothing you've you've, you've got this record this is yours um, every everything we could do, but the journalists wouldn't take it down. And I believe it's still it's still out there. We've never been able to get them to take it take it away. I mean, you could. We spoke to Harry about it, but it is like hundreds of thousands of dollars in in, in court yeah. in court work. So, and then the second time was when they uh, said that we'd been stealing money from the charity. So, with the charity, we we never touched. Um, anything it all went through our accountant everything went through the accountant and they dealt with it all so we had the, the royal foundation audited us st james's place audited us we had the our regular accountant done the audits we had two of them and then the charity regulators done an audit the problem with that one was um the scottish charity regulators is a really small organization so what was meant to take 28 days ended up spilling over into covid and took 18 months to complete so what that done was it meant although the the inquiry came and we were cleared and there was absolutely no wrongdoing whatsoever um you know they gave us a few pointers because this was the first time we'd ever run a multi-million <laughs> charity and <laughs> uh, they definitely gave us a few pointers but uh everything was cool but during that whole time we planned on moving on to the human trafficking one which we had some really big things planned for that but our investors and things just said that we'll just need to wait until the inquiry is done and then you end up losing them. And so really the only people that were ever hurt was the potential for the girls and things that we could have helped during that time. Yeah. Um, and it was just, I, I've never been able to work out the psychology of it, the, the kind of vindictiveness. And um, is it that Dean, you know, made them feel less of a person because he had these capabilities? Is it, I, I really don't know why they done what they done. Um, probably never will know. I don't, I don't understand. Oh, you really want to... You really want to ring some nicks sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I've got two uh, two stories to, to add to that. Um, uh, I'll do the vindictiveness one first. Um, there's a, a, a great guy I've interviewed, um, Pat McNamara, Delta Force Sergeant Major. You're probably aware of him. He does the, the basic dude stuff over in the States. And nicest guy. But when he got out into the, into the uh, civilian world, he was just working for like um, a shooting company, you know, tactical um, training stuff. Long story short, some guy just lied. Um, uh, Pat was um, loading the magazines the night before to have them all ready to go for the next day. And somehow this guy had gone, seen an opportunity and gone, well, he's stealing ammunition. Three months later, after it all blew over, Pat just, Pat was, you know, you know um, that, that old mantra, be friendly, be, be polite, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. <laughs> he was friendly and polite, of course. And, and, and one day he just said, oh, how come, how come that sort of happened? And the guy goes, oh, I just lied because I don't like you. 
you were, you were here, I was here, and I just lied. And Pat basically sort of quit on the day. He just went, it's a just vindictiveness. And the integrity that we have in the special forces, that, that mindset we have, it doesn't comprehend uh, liars to that extent in your own world. The other thing, and it carries on from liars, some kind of segue, can't believe I'm doing that as a, a podcast host, um, is uh, Heston Russell again. Um, he said in his show, the two, the two people that are, the two places that are not regulated are politicians and journalists. They can say whatever they want with no, no law, no criminal um, um, charges at all. You can sue the the uh, the journalist, as you said, Alana, you know, hundreds of thousand dollars, but there's no there's no law stopping them from saying whatever they want, and it's just such a shame. Um, I mean, I can see why that guy did it. He went, it's money, the clicks, all those things, easy easy story, but it doesn't matter showing them the truth because. <laughs> The, um, for the Mail on Sunday, he was the defense editor, which blew my mind. So I was like, surely there's other things you can be talking about as a defense editor than yeah. whether he like rode one bike or two bikes during yeah. <laughs> that yeah. And I think for the people that were saying that, I was like, guys, go and get your own little challenge. Go and find your own thing to do. Like rather than pulling people down, try and raise yourself up. Like, yeah. but um, I, th I don't, th I don't think people like me and you would ever understand their mindset because it, it's, it's not in it. I mean, I see people doing well or something that's a bit. I'm like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get up there, or I'll ask them how they're doing it. And I, I, you know, I speak to people that are better than me all the time to find out how I can get better. And it's yeah. never jealousy or nasty. And I think even you, you spoke about Kelsey there. She'll probably give you some of her stories, but she's got very similar ones. Um. And I remember speaking to her about it when she was like, why are people doing this? And it's, like, it's just it's just a jealousy thing. And it's a very insecure thing in themselves to try and pull others down. When yeah. they're doing, there's no way to really, yeah, there's probably people that get paid a lot of money to try and work out that type of brain. <laughs> <laughs> all, all power to them. Um, you guys ran, raise a ton of money for a great cause doing that. Uh, you, um, an author, um, what inspired you to write um, your books? Was it children's books first? Was the other books that the phenomenal uh, things there? Um, what started you down that route from being a, I mean, I've got it here, bank manager. <laughs> yeah, so my, um, I loved writing. When I was a little girl, I used to just write little poems or little little short stories. I was always doing something. When my my mum passed away when I was 15, and I think it was around about then that I just stopped. I just never wrote again. And then uh, when Dean done his book, I was always writing little notes of my experience during what he was doing. And then people were always saying to him, when's Alana's book? coming out that would be cool to read as well so I'd always kind of penned it and then in 2020 just as just before COVID hit my great auntie died she was 95 but she was kind of that older person to me and she she yeah. was amazing and everybody I mean this woman wow. was single her whole life and traveled the whole world like 19 wow. when she was on little single woman holiday she was fab um so she there was a, a couple of weird things that happened but she had this Parker pen that I always loved and it kind of just appeared and it just sparked the writing in my head and nice. um so I I've you know I've wrote probably like 25 different either short stories or screenplays or various different things but so she who dares is my memoirs and I've just penned that over the last few years uh to tell my life story and then of my story with Dean and etc um the children's books was just really a bit of fun and Dean had kind of challenged me actually I'll, I'll tell the truth that was reading Megan's book Megan said it's a copy of her book uh, The Bench and I kind of read it and I was like oh yeah it's good and Dean was like well could you do any better I said well I think so <laughs> so I kind of just started writing from there so I wrote a couple of, of kids books kids books are easy to write you know they're, they're you know you get an idea and you just put it into something rhyming for them and, and then you just the, the illustrating part that was that was out of my depth completely um, <laughs> and then my business book that's how to ask for money and that really came from it was a conversation I was having with a, a, a business guy here in, in Newport and he said to me um we were talking about money we were talking about investment and he was like oh I've got to go and do this part I hate this part and I said well asking for money he said yeah I said I love that part he's like how can you love asking for money wow. and I said it's been something that has been my my thing and he said it's it's genuine Alana it's in people's top 10 fears 
And I was like, I didn't know that. I, I really didn't know that. So I talked him through what I do and how I do it. And he said, you have to write a book. You have to do this in a book. So, you know, I think I was eight when I done my first sponsored famine. I think that was when I was asking people for money there. <laughs> I became a debt collector when I was 19. Before before that, I'd done door-to-door -door sales. So that was when, I, you know, I would just knock on people's doors, selling things. Yep. And that was a full commission, commission only job. Oh. So you didn't sell, you didn't eat, you know, so... Um, and I like food. So then um, when I got the job as a debt collector, it was a very male environment. Like it was super, super male. And they, they had a specific way of asking for money. And it really wasn't my technique at all. You know, like, you know, my mom was always in debt when we were growing up and we had the guys knocking on the door and shouting and, and you know we were hiding behind the, the windowsill and things so I didn't want to be like that I wanted to help them right. and help their problems so that was my approach and I would take it in the way I would say what what's happening how are you unable to pay what's going on do their assessment do their budget planning and just help them a bit more so I became really good at that job and I was always hitting the targets because they did generally pay me first because I was helping them with, with the other things as well. So I, I kind of developed a system around that, got into the bank management and I was a bank manager in 2008 when um, the, the financial crisis hit and people were losing money left, right and centre. So I was having to right. do a lot of conversations around that that situation. So when we done the fundraising for... The mental health campaign we we i think sorry 1.3 million dollars us we raised for the mental health but we had sponsorship funds that we raised too so um in the book i basically talk through all the, that that ways and i've got this this formula which is called maps and it's basically about mindset accountability planning and strategy and those are the four things that i believe if you get right you'll always be successful so mindset Accountability. Accountability, planning, and strategy. Beautiful. It reminds you of um, Sarah Davis, who whose book is, is over here, um, Paddle the Nile. And I know that um, uh, her and Dina connected um, for his uh, next um, possible journey, but she's a project manager and literally did all those things you just said, mindset, accountability, uh, planning, and strategy for, for her phenomenal journey as well. Um, I, yeah. I'm going to read these books. I, I'm loving yeah. the idea of how to ask for money because, you know, most books have been written before about a subject. Let's be be real. Um, your, but both of yours actually haven't <laughs> really. Um, but the how to ask for money is is absolutely stunning in, a, in an entrepreneur businessman's brain because it, there is a stigma around it. Um, going to the other one, She Who Dares, uh, I interviewed three Delta Force guys together and I said, all right, guys, we want to get the wives on because I titled one of those shows, my wife didn't sign up for this. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of did. You, you knew you were getting an ACF guy as a, as a hubby, um, but I'm really intrigued to, to read that from your point of view because so much with the Special Forces and the Veterans community, we discount, not discount, we, we don't get the wife's side of the story, which is one of the reasons I want to get you on the show today. Yeah, it kind of, I mean, I grew up in Aberdeen in Scotland, which is um, more of an oil and gas uh, city. So right. you know, my granddad worked offshore. Most of the people that I, I knew, the, the guy was away kind of two weeks on, three weeks off, or yeah. it might be you know, four weeks off, like whatever it might be, there was definitely a rotation. Yeah. And I often found that there was uh, a cycle that the women went through, you know, they would get excited that he was coming home, then he would come home and there was this adjustment from being like single mom to, to family again. And then there would be like just settling into the cycle and then it was preparing for them to go away again. So yeah. I found that the military mindset was very similar. And often, you know, especially if it's somebody who travels a lot, is, is stationed in various different places, the woman doesn't get a chance to either settle into friendship groups or get, you know, some career that might need them to be based in the one place you know they have to kind of go where he goes so there is a lot that you've got to adapt to and then on top of that is he safe what's he doing is he going to be okay I mean I know people that the husbands haven't even told their wives that they're in the special forces you know they keep everything to themselves that, wow. and the main dean of of always being that he'll talk obviously he signed the, the official secrets act and everything but 
you know, we talk. So <laughs> I, I genuinely feel the need to decompress somewhere. And if it's not going to be with you, it's it's, it's going to be through some other means that might not be so healthy. So um, everyone should have that person that they can, they can open up to. And, and we've had many of, uh, you know, all night conversations where we've just sat down and talked and, and got all sorts out. But I, I did write the book so that I was hopeful that other women could kind of read it and say, well, I identify with that. I know that feeling, you know. I think there was one particular part in the book where Dean's away in, in Libya and I he's he's in the private sector now. And on the phone, I can literally hear the gunfire on the phone and I'm asking him if he's okay, I'm asking him what's going on. And the line goes dead. And at the same time, I was getting calls from the UK Special Forces. I was getting calls from his his friends around the world. And they were like, nobody's here. Nobody knows what's going on. It's just kicked off between the two militias there. And we don't know what's happening. And it was at the same time, Molly's like, can I get a snack? Can Pepper Pig go on? Can I do this? You're trying to keep both both plates spinning, really. Um, and then I think yeah, the next day Dean called me back and said, Yeah, that you finished the gunfight and then just went straight to bed and went to sleep and forgot to phone me. So like I was like, I'm gonna kill you, but um, <laughs> I'm glad you're safe. So, you, yeah. re you really have, seem to have a, a one plus one equals three relationship, which is is rare. Um I've seen it in, in, in high performing individual uh, high performing partnerships throughout my life, uh, mostly in New Zealand. But um, I like to use the analogy, uh, a, a whole person, one plus maybe half a person, well, you're not even two. But when you get two whole people and uh, working together as a, as a team uh, to the, the, the right direction, it's one plus one equals three, which is just beautiful to hear. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear the book, uh, to, to listen to the book. Uh, I, I, I listen to most of them now, nowadays rather than read. There's not a much time, so a lot of it goes on the car. Yeah, I'm still really. I still. I can't get into it. I've still. I've still got to hold the book in my hand. I've still got to, to read. I can't even do Kindles, etc. I'm just. I need a book. Uh, mine started by um, where I lived in my boy's daycare. So I started off. Um, we co-raised my boy, and it was four days off from the fire station. I'd be a single dad at three months old, and and then four days with his mum, wow. and we had a forty-five minute drive to and from um, the daycare. Um, so 45 minutes up with him in the car and 45 minutes back with me. So I had like three hours driving. So throwing on the audio, uh, the podcast at the time, um, learning a whole bunch of things. And then now it's audio books. So uh, it's, it's pretty cool to be able to get all that stuff into your brain that um, you normally have to sit down and, and, and take time out. I for... how much you absorb as well. That would be quite cool. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, and these things are amazing to, be, to speak to, to people like yourself and, and learn so many things. Uh, you, on that, I mean, again, like I said at the start, you need a whiteboard more than I do, all the different things you've done. I mean, pushing on, you've, you've got the producer, you've got reality TV stuff going on. To keep it within the hour, I'd like to um, be respectful because I actually did a little bit of crowdsourcing yesterday and, and asked the public for some questions for you, which I think is always nice because I'm honored and every time i have a person on the show i literally kick myself that i'm talking to someone um because i was just a, a, a shooter and, and just a fireman so I've, if you would would give me the uh, the time i've got a few questions from from the public for you that they'd like to throw at a, an mbe's way <laughs> um so what's the biggest lesson uh learned from a failure that you that's happened in in your life so Failure to me, I only really believe in failures if you stop trying. I think failure is just every time is just a lesson. Um, and my easiest one is it took me five times to pass my driving test. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for other Americans, it's manual in the UK, but it doesn't make it any better. It was pretty bad. But I think um, I talk about it in how to ask for money, actually, because it is about learning every single time if you're, if you're failing and you're learning. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, well, well we're not really learning, but to me, failure is an awesome thing because it means you're actually trying something that you're not capable of and you're pushing yourself that little bit further. So it only really becomes true failure when you when you stop stop trying. And that yes, I do have my driving lesson, my driving lessons. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's a beautiful answer. Thank you. Um this was a, a really interesting one. Uh given all the things you do, and it was actually directed at both you and I somehow, but how do you prioritize your tasks? and your actions each day? Um, 
I actually, I got given a book quite recently called The Time Cleanse, a really fantastic book that, that did change a lot for me. Um, because when you work out exactly, you know, you'll he you hear it all the time. I don't have enough time to go to the gym. I don't have enough time to play with the kids. I don't have, and the time is there. I think that there's great things on your phone, like screen time checks that probably will scare most people. I done it with my assistant once and it was 13 hours she'd been on social media for. So I was like, oh. the next thing you tell me you can't go to the gym. I'm just, <laughs> that's really um, but you know, screen time is something like people play with their phones because it can just switch off the brain and, and just numb out what's what's going on around you. But it is like a little evil little tool that's stopping you from, from living your life. So for me, it is if you can plan it and have that discipline. And I think you have to really, really want that thing, you know, whether it be for Dean, most of his is based around physical, you know, there, there'll be there'll be a challenge that he's going for, he has to hit a certain amount of reps or stuff that's going on there. Most of mine's is around mental, I can't never, I'm studying for a law degree just now, I have to keep it always kind of moving. So I, I place those boundaries on myself, but I think that if we could just drop the excuses a little bit more and just really step, but but also things with the time cleanse, What one thing that I got was you write down how much time and to the point of like, how much time you're spending in the shower, everything, note it all down and then see what your week actually looks like. And it, I think it would surprise, it surprised me when I done it. So if anybody else tries it. And that harks back to your, your debt collecting days sitting in and down and doing a budget. What a, what a clever um, way to look at things in reality. Yeah, yeah. Well, the budget for itself is something that I always, I've done it with Dean, I do it with my friends that we, I don't have enough money, I can't do it. Um, and then when we look at the the spending habits, you know, I've found people have had like three Netflix subscriptions on <laughs> out of their back. You know, when I first met Dean, he was paying fee upon fee upon fee because he was constantly going overdrawn. And then once I kind of managed that all out for him, he was he was constantly in the green and staying staying correct. So a lot of it is just a lot more planning and preparation and things. So. The Which lot. I think most people are sorry. Most people are really good at on the things they love. It's the things that we don't necessarily like. It gets put to the side. Tell, say that again, please, so I get the context. If people are good at prioritizing the things they love, you know, the things they enjoy doing. Right. Um, it's the things that we don't like that gets, oh, we'll do that later. We'll push that to the side. And as Dean says, I'm going to eat the frog, you know, put that in at the start. I hate cardio. Put it in the start of the day and it's done. And, it, and then you can get on with all the fun stuff. Oh, well done. That is a quote. I like that. That is, is so true. Human behavior, um, what do you call it? When you're, you're putting things off all the time, procrastination, all those things, there must be must be coming from somewhere in there. And it's a bit of bit of, of, of fight or flight, really, and, and you're running away from it. <laughs> uh, the third question, uh, last public question, then maybe I'll throw mine in and, and, and wrap it up. Uh, what do you contribute to your success for... Um, such an esteemed honour as the MBE? Um, I think I never focused on anything like that. I focus on what it is that I'm doing. I think when I done, for example, the Mrs. World competition, that was just something I went into because it was out of my comfort zone. I just wanted to do something that I'd never, never would dream of doing. So I, I gave it a go. But a part of mrs world type competitions are that you've got to work in philanthropy in some way well i already done that all the other girls you know they're kind of teaching me about beauty and hair and makeup and how <laughs> to walk apparently i didn't know how to walk so that was something that i got taught by by the, the the girls in the beauty pageant world but um philanthropy they had to almost like create and bring into their world because it yeah. wasn't part of Doing. so it was almost unnatural for them to to be doing it and I could see that a lot of them really struggled with that give back element where it's something that I've always naturally just done and I've just carried on doing it and it was never for awards or praise it was just because it makes me feel better and I genuinely believe that if ever I'm having a really bad day I'll just go and do some random act of kindness or just do something nice and I always feel better so um, it was definitely not something that I ever focused. I'm sure, I'm sure, if you won an award and you focused on it and you, you went and got it equally, you'd be able to do it. But um, it was just a nice little sprinkling on the top of what we already do. Of course, and look, the way you answered that, Elena, actually showed um, um, 
the contribution to your success success because it was a big big question uh, and relatively open ended question that um i think Jeanette wrote down um it's authenticity you're authentic at what you're doing and th that's the whole point of of, of getting a, a gong or getting um a, a, an award and, and so on and even the way you answered it showed it there <laughs> but you made me laugh at the start again you you screwed me because you threw down Miss, mrs scotland and, and going the mrs world competition because originally I was going to title this a, a Miss to New Zealand interviews a Mrs. Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get into that another day. But I'm, to finish up, I'd like to ask you a question that um, I, I often ask um, a guest. It's a two word check in. And given the Kiwi accent, it's checking in on you using two descriptive um, words about uh, emotion, how you're feeling. What, how, can we do a two word check in on Alana Stott? Uh, today um excited would be one um and oh i can't think of the second word that's a good one you've just you just stumbled me um it, it throws everybody because it, it's it's, it's, it's a real excited and grateful i'm excited oh. for the future everything that's coming up and everything that i'm doing and i'm grateful for everything i've got right now oh that's that's beautiful and you guys um You've got a lot coming up. I, um, I, Dean alluded to in just the right amount of words to um, uh, the, the project he's working on with a major um, uh, media company. Um, do you have anything big coming up as well that you're excited about? Um, so I've got, Apart from the law degree and all the other things. Yeah, well, I mean, they, they, I've got five books coming out this year. So one's already out, Live Your Own Way, and then the other two children are scattered throughout the year. How to Ask for Money is May, and then She Who Dares is July. Uh, I go back to the UK to get the medal in July as well, which would be cool to see the family too. Um, and then I'm working on a couple of TV things, which are are quite exciting. More, I'm Dean's in front of the camera, I'm behind the camera. So... Um, <laughs> But yeah, I've got some things we've done quite a bit of work with Afghanistan and things. So there's some stuff coming up with that, which I'm really excited about with the women there that we're helping. So fingers crossed that one comes up. So it'll be good. And you're off to meet the king in the middle of the year. Is he presenting? Yeah. So July, I believe it's either the third, fourth, or the fifth of July that he's he's doing it. So that that'll be that'll be nice. It's at Holyrood Palace as well, which is in um Edinburgh. And I've never been to that. I've been oh. to all the the, the England ones, as in Buckingham Palace and St James, etc. But this will be quite cool, my home country. Oh, that is brilliant! Awesome. Look again in the in the start of the show. Uh, I do a, a video intro and audio intro for the ones on the audio. But um, where's the best place to to look for your books and to find out more about you? Uh, yeah, so alanastott.com is probably the easiest. But across all socials, it's just that same Alana Stott. Um, and then the book's going to be available wherever you buy books, I guess. Oh, look, I'm very excited to, to read them. They, they're right up my alley. They're filling gaps that, that haven't been filled. So thank you so much for your time. Maybe we'll get to unpack this, uh, all the other things at a, at a later date, but it's just been beautiful to talk to you. Absolute pleasure, Alana. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks for watching. I'm Damien Porter, former Special Forces Operator, and check out my new project for 2023, at hownottodie.com.au, where I've combined all my special forces training and police officer experience to help others. Thanks for watching.